Alhamdulillahi wa kafa Wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi Alladhi nastafa Khususan ala afdalihim Wa khatamin nabiyyin Muhammadin al-amin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa ba' Fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wa nazzalna alayka al-kitaba tibiyannan li kulli shayh Wa hudan wa rahmatan wa bushra lil muslimin Sadaqallahu l'azim Surat al-Nahl of the Qur'an And we sent down the book on thee O Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam that this book might explain all things and therefore that this book might explain that strangest of all events to occur in the religious history of mankind when Banu Israel who had been expelled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expelled from the Holy Land and then banned from returning to reclaim it. Two thousand years later, strangely, mysteriously, mystifyingly, Banu Israel returned to the Holy Land and reclaim it as their own. This Quran and only this Quran will explain that event. And this Quran will explain that equally strange event when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed the state of Israel and then for 2,000 years it never existed and then strangely bafflingly mysteriously mystifyingly a state of Israel is restored in the Holy Land this Quran will explain it. And in this Quran there is guidance. How to respond to that strange dunya in that age which will witness the return of the Jews to the Holy Land to reclaim it. And witness the restoration of the state of Israel in the Holy Land. How do we live in that dunya? How do we respond to its awesome challenges? This Quran will explain it. That explanation and that guidance have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an act of rahmah, kindness, raindrops. And for those who have the good sense and the wisdom to go to the book of Allah and search in it, Search in it if you are 17 years of age tonight or 18 or 19 or 20 or 21 or 22. This lecture is for you tonight. Yes, it's for you. The others can listen, of course. <laughs> but this lecture is for you. If you go to the Quran and search with tears in your eyes, and tears in your heart. Search. And when Allah blesses you with that understanding of that explanation and that guidance, you accept it and you embrace it and you apply it regardless of the price that you may have to pay, my son. Mushra lahum. Good news. Glad tidings for you you will understand what others cannot and you will succeed when others will not we praise Allah and we glorify him this night and we beseech him most humbly for his guidance and for his blessings and for his protection and we need that protection more and more every day that passes by. As we attempt to address the subject, Jerusalem, in the Quran. 
And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, and in particular on the last of them all, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. The Imam recited, Ba'da'udhu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajeem, Subhanallazi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير Glory be to him who took his servant by night from this sacred masjid built by Ibrahim عليه السلام on the foundations of the spot where Adam alayhi salam had worshipped. This masjid was in the Torah. They took it out. Took him by night from this masjid on a miraculous journey to that masjid, that distant one bit by Suleiman alayhi salam. Alladhi barakna hawla which was located in a land which we had blessed. Don't use the word precincts. <laughs> Don't use the word surroundings. <laughs> because it's the whole land which has been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which was located in the Holy Land. The Holy Land appears in the Quran for the first time in Surah Al-Anbiya. When you remember he was a young man, just a young man, and he went and he broke up the idols. Today the idols are ruling the world. The idols are sitting in the Security Council of the UN. <laughs> and he went and he broke up the idols. And they decided to punish him. And they threw him into the fire. Allah is pleased when a young man stands up firmly for Allah. When you are old and your beard is white, it's not the same thing anymore. Allah is pleased when a young man stands up courageously, courageously for the truth. And so Allah spoke to the fire. Fire always burns, but this time no. Allah ordered the fire, be cool for Ibrahim and keep him safe. Allah can intervene at any time he wants to protect whomsoever he wants. Because he is fa'alul lima yurid. He can do whatever he wants to do. And he says, haqqun alayna nasrul mu'mineen. It is obligatory upon us to do that. Ibrahim alayhi salam can no longer live in Babylon. Today it's called Iraq. And so he's given orders to make hijrah. And we took him and his nephew Lut alayhi salam to a land in which we had placed blessings for all of mankind. Mark the words for all of mankind. But when he reached in that holy land, he is tested. Take the mother and take the baby. Take them out there in the desert and leave them there. No food, no water, no shelter, no security. What is the role of reason in religion? Uncle Sam says, you know Uncle Sam, ruling the world, that religion must conform to reason. That reason must sit in judgment over religion. And if reason were to sit in judgment over this, it doesn't make sense. Take the mother and take the baby, take them out there in the desert and leave them there. No food, no water, no shelter, no security. Had it been Iblis, he would have taken off his hat, he would have scratched his head, he said, no, this is irrational. Even though it's the command of the Lord, 
I'm not going to do it. Didn't he do that? When ordered to bow down? He said, no. Why should I do that? It's irrational. It's illogical. You created me from fire. You created him from clay. You don't have to be a, a, a PhD from University of New South Wales to know that fire is superior to clay. It follows logically therefrom. I am superior to him. I'm not bowing down. Because reason, reason must sit in judgment over religion. And religion must conform to the requirements of reason. And so the great logician named Iblis, he disobeyed Allah. But not Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is the first teach, the first lesson that my teacher of blessed memory taught me. The very first lesson I received as a student of the Alima Institute of Islamic Studies was this lesson. He taught us. Of course, I was a young man at that time. He said, when once you know it is the word of Allah, whether you understand it or you don't, whether you are comfortable with it or not, you must submit to it. That is Islam. That's the first lesson I got. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam left them there. Rabbana inni askantu min zurriyati biwadin ghayri zi zara inda baytika al muharram. Oh my Lord, I've left them there. In that barren valley where nothing grows, I've left them there. You asked me to do it, I've done it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders him, sacrifice your son. What? I didn't hear that. Sacrifice your son. Oh no. Religion must conform to reason. And this is irrational. Argues, of course, Iblis, scratching his head. Religion must conform to reason. And this is irrational, that religion should ask of me to sacrifice my son. I ain't going to do it. That's the way of Iblis. And that's the way of those who come out of the universities established by Iblis. And so they'll change the religion to make it conform with the requirements of the modern age. They will subject the verses of the Quran to what they call a progressive interpretation. So that they can conform with the requirements of the modern, excuse me, godless age. But not Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ya Bunaya. Inni ara fil manami anni azbahuk. Fanzur maza tara. Son, I've been ordered to sacrifice you. By Allah. Son, what is your response? I'm ready, are you? I'm ready, are you? A worthy son of a worthy father. And he says, Ya abati fa'al ma tu'mar. Oh my father, go ahead. Do what you've been ordered to do. I'm also ready. Satajiduni. And then he uses the word that the godless world never uses. Satajiduni. Insha'Allah. You never hear that from their lips. It is very easy to recognize the godless world. Because when it walks around, it'll never see, never see, never see. Insha'Allah. Huh? And so Ibrahim alayhi salam has passed every test. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses him. Inni ja'iluka linnasi imama. I hereby appoint you as the imam of all of mankind, including George Bush. <laughs> I hereby appoint you the Imam of all of mankind. If he is the Imam of all of mankind, 
and you are engaged in that, stu that stuff called interfaith, you heard about it? Interfaith? Well then listen to me. If he is the Imam of all of mankind, it follows that his religion is the religion of all of mankind. Anyone disagrees? No? If his religion is the religion of all of mankind, it follows that there is only one true religion, it is his religion. Anyone disagrees? <coughs> there is only one true religion. All others are false. Only one true religion. Is that chauvinism? Or is that truth? The Quran addresses Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and says to him, ثُمَّ أَوْحَيْنَ إِلَيْكَ And then we reveal to thee, O Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam, أَنِ اتَّبِعْ مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفَ That you also, you must follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And this is the Holy Land. And he is the Imam of all mankind. And there is only one true religion. It is his religion. Now we leave the Holy Land for a while. And we go to Banu Israel, who lived from the seed of Ibrahim -Islam, in the Holy Land until Yusuf -Islam, is taken out of the well by the travelers. Are you shaking your heads? You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Taken out of the well and taken to Egypt and sold. Oh no, not to Egypt, sorry. Taken to Misr. Because they're not the same, you know. Even Egyptians don't know that. <laughs> taken to Misr and sold in slavery in Misr. And then he becomes the Prime Minister, hmm? and then his family come to live with him. So Banu Israel are now in Misr, which is the Eastern Delta. But then some things occur which eventually led to their being enslaved in Egypt. And for that you're going to have to invite me to come and lecture on the subject of Ashura in the Quran. Ashura in the Quran, to know why were Banu Israel enslaved in Egypt. We don't have the time to take that up. And then Allah raised Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam took them over into freedom across the sea. وَإِسْفَرَكْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَكْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْزُرُونَ hmm? So they crossed the Red Sea. And now they are in Sinai. Sinai, not the hospital in Manhattan. The desert. And then Musa al-Islam went up the mountain, came back down with the Torah, the Ten Commandments, stone tablets. Hmm? And then Musa al-Islam addresses Banu Israel, and this is in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And every, thing, every single ayah of the Quran I quote, you go and find it in the Quran and study it. Hmm? Musa al-Islam says, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeeb, he says, Ya qawmid khulul arda al-muqaddasata allati Oh my people, come on, let us enter, fight and take control of the holy land which Allah gave to you. Did you hear that? The Quran declares that Allah gave the land to the Jews or to Banu Israel. Well, then how come we don't hear the state of Israel talking about that? How come the New York Times doesn't publish that as a headline? Why are they so afraid of the Quran? And why don't you use the Quran to wage the terrific battle against them? Wajahidhum bihi jihadan kabira, says Allah. Wage a mighty struggle against them using the Quran. That's what he has ordered us to do. The reason why they will not quote the Quran is because they don't want the attention of mankind to be directed towards the Quran. 
because the Quran will expose their fraud. Yes, Allah gave the land to them. But the grant of the land was not unconditional. It was conditional. What were the conditions? وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِسُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ Which ard? al ard al That in order to inherit the Holy Land, you must conform with two requirements. Number one, you must be a servant of Allah. And a servant of Allah will follow the Imam appointed by Allah and would follow the religion of that Imam. So you must follow the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And condition number two, you have to be righteous in your conduct. When Musa alayhi salam ordered them to come on and let's fight, when they learned that there were powerful people living in the land, you know the story of Goliath, hmm? they said, no, we're not going. We're not going. You and your Lord, both of you go and fight. We go stay right here. For us, it's something difficult. Difficult to stomach. When the Lord has just performed this miracle before your very eyes, He parted the sea for you and saved you and destroyed Firaun and his army before your very eyes. And when that Nabi who led you to freedom is still there in your midst, and that you should respond with such insolence. It is something beyond comprehension. So maybe now we can begin to understand the nature of the problem that we're dealing with in the world today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who had given the holy down to them now puts a bar. He bans them from entering into the Holy Land for how long? How long? How long? Twelve years? Forty years. Good. Do you don't mind my questioning you? You don't fall asleep. Forty years. So here is evidence. Plain as daylight for every Jew to understand and accept. That although the land was given to him, he's now debarred from entering. Why? There's only one answer to that question. He has violated the conditions of inheritance. But someone changed the word of Allah. And every time you change the word of Allah, you plant an evil seed. And one day, one day, it's going to come back at you. It will grow into an evil tree and ain't nobody can cut it down. They change the word of Allah. You'll find this in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran. You'll also find it in my previous book, The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel, a view from the Quran. What did they do? They wrote into the Torah with their own hands. What did they write? It is not because of righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this good land to inherit it. No, 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 not because of your righteousness. For you are a stiff-necked people. And so it's because of the righteousness of your forefathers, indicating that righteousness is not a condition for you to continue to inherit the Holy Land. And so the land is yours unconditionally. The land is yours whether you are righteous or you are wicked. The land is yours whether you follow the religion of Abraham or you don't. It is still your land. That was an evil seed. And it grew into an evil tree called the Zionist movement. And the Zionist movement is exploiting it to the hilt. And the Jew who can see can do nothing about it.
And of course, there are some Jews who can see, you know. Not all of them are one-eyed. <laughs> but there's nothing they can do about it. Nothing they can do about it. It's too late now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually allowed them to enter into the Holy Land after 40 years. And Dawood alayhi salam establishes the state of Israel. The first Islamic state. And establishes Jerusalem as the capital of the first Islamic state. And he is succeeded by his son Suleiman, Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam. And he builds the masjid in the capital city of the Islamic State. And when you read the story in the Quran of Suleiman alayhi salam and the Queen of Sheba, read between the lines and you'll see in that story the recognition of the State of Israel as the ruling state in the world. And the definition of a ruling state is that it can impose its will on any rival. And so this is the golden age, the golden age of Banu Israel, the time of Nabi Dawood alayhi salam and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam. But after the death of Suleiman alayhi salam, then there was rivalry. We don't have the time, I'm afraid, to go into those details. But I mentioned to you last December when I was here a very interesting book that you might want to read. It's entitled, Who Wrote the Bible? Who Wrote the Bible? It was written by an American scholar of the Bible who is recognized for his scholarship, a professor of Harvard. His name is Richard Friedman, and the book is sold for about eleven, twelve dollars. In that book, Richard Friedman exposes for you all the fraud in the Bible, in the Torah, the rewriting of the Torah so many times. He's able to identify this writer, he wrote this passage and that passage and that passage and that passage. And this second writer, he wrote this passage and this passage and that passage. By comparing the writing, the style of the writing. He also explains why this rewriting of the Torah takes place. Because of rivalry between the descendants of Harun alayhi salam and the descendants of Musa alayhi salam. One of the things which were rewritten, of course, concerns the... You don't mind my mentioning it? Huh? The prohibition of riba. You still don't mention? Don't mind? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had prohibited riba in the Torah. They changed the Torah. They rewrote it. The Torah now says, you can find it, go look in it, you'll find it. It's still there. It is haram for a Jew to lend money on interest to another Jew. Rabbi, can you tell me why? Answer, don't rip off your own brother. <laughs> That's why. It is haram for a Jew to lend money on interest to another Jew. But it is halal, he can lend money on interest to those who are not Jews. It's called double standards. It's called double standards. And it stinks. Because of this change they've made in the Torah concerning riba, among other things, they have now violated the condition of righteous conduct. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to this. In Surah to Bani Israel, he refers to this as fasad. Fasad is corruption. This is the corruption of the word of Allah. <laughs> لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَقَدَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ فِي الْكِتَابِ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعْلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا That we recorded it 
in the Torah, in the Zabur, in the Torah, that Banu Israel will commit fasad in the land, Yani Al Ardul Muqaddasa, in the Holy Land, on two occasions. This is the first one. When the word of Allah is rewritten, corrupted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to it by sending an army from Babylon. An army that worshipped the sun and the moon and the stars and idols. Ibadan lana, he says. And some Arabs have been saying to me, No, Imran, Allah will not refer to a people who are disbelievers as Ibad. To which we respond with Surah Yaseen, Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. Ya hasratan ala al-ibad. Ma yatihim min ayatin ila akhir al-aya. So these ibad are sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they destroy the state of Israel. And they destroy the masjid. And they take Banu Israel into slavery in Babylon. And so now they're, they're weeping by the rivers of Babylon. While they're out there in Babylon, however, a very important communication from Allah, which explains history, which explains politics, which explains the economy, and you, you're talking to someone who studied international relations eh? at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva, so I know something about the subject. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a prophet, Isaiah. He sends many other prophets, but this one in particular, to communicate a divine promise. What is the promise? That Allah was going to send a prophet to Banu Israel. Who would be their prophet? And who would be known as Al-Masih, the Messiah? And who when he comes will rule the world from the throne of Dawood alayhi salam with a rule which will be eternal. The throne of Dawood alayhi salam is the state of Israel. It is Jerusalem. And so when the Messiah comes, he will rule the world from Jerusalem. Which is why Mr. Bush is so anxious to attack Iraq. Yes. You don't understand, eh? The Jews realized that if the Messiah is to rule the world from Jerusalem when he comes, and Jerusalem is under Babylonian occupation, then there are certain very simple logical deductions. Number one, the Messiah will have to liberate the Holy Land, which is now under Babylonian occupation. Number two, the Messiah will have to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land, not as tourists, but to reclaim it. Number three, the Messiah will have to restore the state of Israel in the Holy Land. And number four, that state of Israel, of Israel, will have to become once again the ruling state in the world. And then the Messiah can rule the world from Jerusalem, from this, the, the throne of Dawood, alayhi salam. In other words, when the Messiah comes, he will have to bring back the golden age when the Jews rule the world. Shall I repeat that? When the Messiah comes, he will have to bring back the golden age when the Jews rule the world. And so in the heart of every Jew, there is this absolute conviction that one day we will rule the world once again. And when we do that, we will rule forever.
But when Allah sent the Messiah, I'm going to have to cut some corners now eh, because of time. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Messiah, some of them accepted him. The young ones, the poor, the humble, the innocent. فَآمَنَ طَائِفَةُ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ But the rabbis, the administration, the establishment, they rejected him. وَكَفَرَ طَائِفَةً Why did they reject him? They say he's a bastard. وَنَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ هَذَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had tested them and because they were seeing with only one eye, they failed the test. If they had been seeing with two eyes, you know, Dajjal sees with one, and all those who follow Dajjal see with one, even when they're issuing all their fatwas and so on, they still see with one. But if you see with two eyes, which are the two? The external and the internal. internal. Then they would have said, wait a minute. Nobody knew that she was pregnant. Huh? Nobody knew she was pregnant. And from the time she was age two until the age of puberty, she lived in the temple. And she had the chief rabbi himself as her guardian, Zakaria, alayhi salam. And our chief rabbi himself told us of the miracle. The mihrab in those days were not a niche in the wall. The mihrab was an inner room called the Holy of the Holies. And in that inner room, only the sacred relics were kept. Hmm? And only the chief rabbi could enter that room, nobody else. Because she was under his guardianship, she was allowed into enter into the mihrab. Hmm. Nobody else. When the old man went in into the mihrab one day, he saw her with food. He said, Maryam, anna laki hadha. Maryam, where did you get this food? She said, I asked and he sent it. So the old man must have taken off his hat and scratched his head. She asked, I he sent it. And I want a son. I better ask too. <laughs> huh? And then, of course, you know the story. He went in into the mihrab now by himself, all alone, nobody with him, and he asked. And the angel came and said, Allah has accept, accepted your salah, your dua. And you're going to have a son, and Allah even gave him a name already. What's his name? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Hmm? So the, the whole world knew, knew this story. Everybody in the land knew it. This was the most famous girl in the whole land. This was the most learned girl in the whole land. This was the most virtuous girl in the whole land. This Jewish girl. And no one knew she was pregnant. She had left the town before her pregnancy could be observed. When the baby was born, if she had committed that vile deed, then what she should have done was to try to conceal her sin. Maybe take the baby, put it in front of somebody's front door, knock on the door, and run away. Huh? In New York, of course, they do something else, throw it in the garbage bin. But she didn't do that. She didn't do that. She came back with the baby. She came back with the baby in front of her, not behind her. She came through the front road, not through the back road. She came in the daylight, not in the night time. She knew who the baby was because the angel told her, this is the Messiah. And she knew that this is a test, so she has to be silent. So when they questioned her, Mary, how could you do this thing? Your father and mother were not like this. She only pointed to the baby. Mary, babies don't talk. But this time the baby talked. 
And when the baby declared that I am the messenger of Allah, they responded and they said, Hadha sikhrum mubeen. A plain magic. So they said he could not be the Messiah. Why? Because he's a bastard. Wa billah min hadha. And then when he lambasted them for their riba, and I was in South Africa for the last three months, and when I started talking on riba, I saw people started moving away from me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, this subject is a wonderful subject, <laughs> riba. <laughs> When he started lambasting them for the riba, he went into the temple, the masjid, and he found them engaged in riba, not the lending and borrowing of interest, on interest, the other form of riba that I'll be speaking about in my subject on Islam and the international monetary system. He cursed them, and he turned over their tables, and he chased them out of the masjid. And he declared that you've taken the house of Allah and transformed it into a den of thieves. And then decided he must die. And then they forced the hand of the Roman government to execute him. But how? By hanging. Crucifixion. Why did they want him to die like that? Because it's still there in the Torah. It is still there up to now. They've not taken it out. They're not going to take it out. Whoever dies by hanging is the cursed of Allah. So if we can get him to die like that, it will now become absolutely plain and clear beyond the shadow of a doubt. He could not have been the Messiah. And then when they saw him die, they were so overjoyed they could dance with joy. Waka him, Allah says, they're boasting now. Inna. قَتَلْنَا الْمَسِيحَ عِيسَ بْنَ مَرْيَمَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ This is called sarcasm. We've killed him. The Messiah, meaning sarcasm. The son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. They didn't believe all of that. They thought he was an imposter. When they saw him die on the cross before their very eyes, it was now absolutely plain and clear, beyond a shadow of a doubt, he could not have been the Messiah. Why? He has the curse of the Lord upon him. Why? He's dead, but he never ruled the world from Jerusalem with a rule which is eternal. Huh? What they didn't know and what no one knew Absolutely no one knew. Not even the Pope. <laughs> Until Allah revealed the Quran, no one knew it. Was Wamaqataluhu. No, they did not kill him. That was their first objective, to kill him. So Allah says you did not achieve objective number one. Wama salabuhu. Objective number two was to cause him to die on the cross, not on the ordinary death. So Allah says, no, you did not achieve objective number two as well, because he was not crucified. Well, I can shubbiha lahum, Allah made it appear unto you that that was what happened. But rafa'ahu Allahu ilayhi, Allah raised him unto himself. One day he's coming back. And guess what he's going to do when he comes back? He's going to rule the world. He's going to rule the world from Jerusalem with a rule which will be eternal. And so that will be the end of history. Tell that to Francis Fukuyama for me. Tell that to Francis Fukuyama and Samuel Huntington for me. This is the truth, not what they have. When he comes back and rules the world with eternal rule from Jerusalem, it is Islam which will be established in the Holy Land. And so Islam will rule the world. And no government, including the government of Australia, can stop that. Let them take that and chew it. 
By my estimate, and you're going to have to read my book to understand how I arrive at this conclusion, I use two methods. My understanding is that that day is about 50 years away from now. And I can be wrong, of course. I can be wrong. But it's interesting for you to examine the method I've used. Two different routes to arrive at this conclusion that that day is just around the corner. I may not see, live to see it. My son may not live to see it, but my grandson may see it. After they had boasted of how they crucified him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded and listened to the ayah. Listen to it. Because in this ayah is located the historical process. He says, Wa'im min ahlil kitab illa la yu'minanna bihi qabla mawti wa yawm al qiyamati yakunu alayhim shaheeda if you are an Arab and you can understand directly the ayah of the Quran, the taste in your mouth is sweeter. But if you have to depend upon a translation, it ain't the same thing anymore. <laughs> Which is why you must learn sufficient Arabic to be able to understand. Wa immin ahlil kitab. Illa la yu'minanna bihi qabla mawti wa yawm al qiyamati yakunu alayhim shaheed Oh, it's like music in the eyes of, in the ears of the Palestinians now. Allah is warning. He says, not a single one of you will escape. Every single Jew on that day when the son of Mary comes back, and before he experiences mouth like everyone else in Kulu Nafsin Za'ikatul Maut, every soul must taste death, including the Son of Mary. So before that event takes place, when he returns, every single Jew will now have to accept him as the Messiah. I went in a synagogue in New York, and I told them that. <laughs> when the lecture was over, the Jews surrounded me. <laughs> I was in the center and they were all around me. And they were furious. They were demanding why, why, why should we be forced to do something we don't want to do? So I said, on that day you'll be able to see that which you're not seeing now. You will have, of course they never invited me back to the synagogue. <laughs> And every Christian on that day, including the Pope, will have to accept that he is Nabi, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, exactly as Muhammad alayhi salatu salam said, and that he ain't no son of God, and there ain't no trinity. And so that is the end of Christianity. The cross is broken. And the swine are killed. And only one true religion now remains. When they accept him now as Nabi and as Al-Masih, it will be of no benefit to them. Because this is the last moment now when this, the, the eyes are unveiled and you can now see when death is staring you in your face. Because at that moment when the son of Mary comes back, and they can now see, now it's too late. Because now the Muslim army will come and liberate the Holy Land. And no one can stop that army. He said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, He said, when you see the black flags coming from the direction of Khorasan, go and join our army, even if you have to crawl over ice. Because no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. Hmm? They now die the worst possible death, knowing that all that they had held on to as truth was falsehood, and all that they had opposed and demonized and rejected as falsehood 
was the truth. So they die the most horrible of all deaths. And when they are raised for judgment, he gives evidence against them and they go into the hellfire. Who died like that? Who died like that? Yes. When he was drowning underneath the water. When he was drowning. And death was staring him in his eyes. Then the veils were removed the eyes. And he said, now I believe in the God of Banu Israel. To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded. And we never knew about this. No. For thousands of years we never knew about this. No university in the world knew about it. Until the Quran was revealed. Al-An. Now Fir'aun. Surah Yusuf. No. Yes, Surah Yunus. Al-An, now Fir'aun? وَقَدْ عَصَيْتَ قَبْلَ And before this you were in such obstinate rejection. وَقُنْتَ مِنَ الْغَافِلِينَ فَالْيَوْمَ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكَ This day we have determined to preserve your physical body. لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً so that your body, when it is recovered in history, will function as a sign of all signs, as big as a billboard, for a people who will suffer the same fate that you suffered. That the countdown has now begun for them. لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا لَغَافِلُونَ How pathetic is this language? How sad is this language? He says most people, they don't have time for my ayat. They're too busy. You gotta go to work and come back home and earn money to buy the BMW. So they don't have time for my ayat. How pathetic is this language? How sad in this language وَإِنَّ كَثِيرًا مِنَ النَّاسِ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا لَغَافِلُونَ They are oblivious of the ayat of Allah which unfold in the historical process and are as big as billboards facing them. When was the body of Pharaoh recovered? At the end of the 19th century. And that was when the countdown began. That you are now going to face the same fate that he suffered. You will die the way he died. Hmm? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now expels them from the Holy Land. <coughs> because of this second facade, the killing of the prophets. But this time when he expelled them from the Holy Land, it was different from the first time. The first time they lived as one homogeneous community in Babylon. And they had prophets of Allah coming to them. But this time, they are scattered up. Broken up into bits and pieces and scattered all over the world. He says so in Surah Al-A'raf. وَقَطْعَنَاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُمَمْ and we broke them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. So Jews in Argentina and Jews in China. And in Russia. Maybe even in Australia. This was punishment from Allah, but Rabbi says no. Rabbi says this is the divine wisdom at work to allow the truth to reach all of mankind. <laughs> Having expelled them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now bans their return. Where does he say so? Waharamun. This is the only ayah of the Quran I ever recite word by word. The only one. Waharamun ala karyatin ahlaknaha annahum La yarjoon. Hatta 
اذا فتحت ياجوج وماجوج وهم من كل حدب ينسلون الله speaks about a qarya or a town which he destroyed and the people were expelled and having expelled them he placed a ban on them they could never return they could come back as tourists <laughs> but you cannot return to reclaim the town until until when until Allah brings down the barrier built by Zulkarnain what happened I'm not seeing your heads shaking until Allah brings down the barrier built by Zulkarnain and Ya'juj and Ma'juj are now released. Hmm? When Ya'juj and Ma'juj are released, number one. Number two, وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ And when they spread out in all directions, which is your globalization, and they take control of the world, and of course we know about Gog and Magog, Hadith al-Qudsi, I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. Even if we didn't have this Hadith in Sahih Muslim, Implicit in Surah Al-Kaf is the power, the indestructible power of Gog and Magog. It's there in Surah Al-Kaf. But Sahih Muslim gives it plain and clear. I have created creatures of mind so powerful that none but I can destroy them. So when they take over the world, they take control of the sea, they take control of the land, they take control of the air, it becomes the world order of Gog and Magog. They will now use that power and control over the world to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land, to reclaim the Holy Land. And you will see a state of Israel being restored into the Holy Land. Which town is this? Which Qarya? Hmm? The method we have used is to go to the Prophet Muhammad Let him answer the question. So we go to the Ahadith on Gog and Magog. Yesterday, meaning 15 years ago, yesterday we'd have to spend three months to find all those Ahadith. But today, with the Hadith CD, with the Hadith CD, in half a minute, and you have all the Ahadith on Gog and Magog, in nine books of Ahadith, 58. So now let's go through all of these ahadiths to find if Allah, Allah's messenger has ever mentioned any town connected with Gaga Magag. When we go through all 58 ahadiths, we find only one town mentioned, only one, connected with Gaga Magag. Which one is it? Jerusalem. Of course, not in English, in Arabic, Baytul Maqdis. And so we conclude. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا The Qarya is Jerusalem. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has now placed a ban on them. They can never return to reclaim that holy land. Secondly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is أَرْحَمُ rahimin He now says to them, even though you have committed this most heinous of all crimes, this evil deed which, which surpasses every evil deed in history that you have done to the Messenger of Allah. Still, still says Allah, Asa Rabbukum Ayyarhamakum. It is still possible that your Lord can have mercy on you. Still possible. What must Banu Israel do? to earn Allah's mercy and forgiveness? The answer is at the end of Surah Al-A'raf. When that Nabi comes, who is a Nabi Al-Ummi, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, when we use the word Ummi, we understand someone who cannot read and cannot write, illiterate. But when the Jew uses the word Ummi, he doesn't mean that. Oh no. <laughs> he means the one who is not a Jew, a Gentile. And we will quote from Surah to Ali Imran to prove this point when we give the lecture on Islam and the international monetary system in Salah. 
when that nabi comes who is a nabi ummi the prophet who will not be a jew he'll be a gentile if you accept him and believe in him and obey him and follow him and assist him and respect him then allah will have mercy on you but if you do not and if you return to the holy land with your facade then mark it down clearly وَإِنْ عُدْتُمْ عُدْنَا We will return with our punishment. The first time around, it was a Babylonian army. The second time, it was a Roman army which threw them out of the Holy Land. And if you come back with your facade after 2,000 years, then we will return with the same punishment. But this time, it will be the army which follows Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. And so when the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam arrived in Medina after the Hijrah, it was such a dramatic moment in history that it was as though time stood still. And all the heavens are watching. All the Anbiya alayhim salam are watching. What's going to happen? I mean, it was terrific drama when the Prophet alayhim arrived in Medina. Because the cream of Jewish scholarship is here in Medina. Bismillah. When he arrived in Medina, he acted in such a way that would assist them to confirm that he was indeed a prophet of Allah. Why? What did he do? He followed their Sharia. He did it even when they were not following their Sharia. <laughs> Number one. Their Sharia gave the Jerusalem as the Qibla. So he prayed in the direction of that Qibla. Number two, their Sharia gave fasting, Saum, from, from sunset until sunset. No food, no drink, and the most difficult one of all for us, you, you had to stay away from your wives all through the night. That was difficult for some of us. <laughs> yes, it was difficult for some of us. And Allah says in the Quran, He says, I know what you are doing. <laughs> I know what you are doing. And now I've turned towards you mercifully. This day in Surah Al-Baqarah. So this was number two. He fasted with them on the days when they fasted. And in accordance with the rules of fasting in the Torah. But there's a third thing that he did which I did not recognize when I wrote the book. Only after I completed the book then I realized that there was a third thing. What was the third one? He enforced the law of the Sharia. For the punishment for adultery. Which was stoning to death. They themselves were not enforcing that law. <laughs> and he revived the law, which they had abandoned. And when they questioned him on it, he said, bring the Torah. Go search in it, don't you find it? And they put their fingers on the ayah to block it off. That the Torah had prescribed stoning to death as a punishment for adultery. This was meant to impress upon Banu Israel that this is indeed a true prophet of Allah. After 17 months had passed, it was now plain and clear that Banu Israel had rejected Muhammad and rejected the Quran 
and were now conspiring to destroy Islam. At this moment, Asa Rabbukum Ayyarhamakum was closed. The door to mercy was closed to Banu Israel as an ummah. Now, tilka ummatun qad khalat. The door to mercy is closed to Banu Israel. Allah now introduces something called naskh. Ma nansakh min ayatin aw nunsiha na'ati bi khayrin minha aw mithliha. We do not cancel or abrogate any ayah which would be a law giving ayah but that we replace it with that which is similar or better. He didn't say different, did he? Did he? No, 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 he didn't say different. He said similar or better. He didn't say different. So that which replaces must be either similar or better, not different. So he now sends down Naskh. And that Qibla is now Mansukh. This is the new Qibla. He sends down revelation giving you a new law of fasting. So that law of fasting is now Mansukh. This is the new law of fasting. And now the surprise for you all. He now sends down revelation. It is at this time he sends down the revelation. It is at this time he sends it down. To change that law on the punishment for adultery. That law is now mansukh. This is the new law. And it is now a public flogging. Somehow or the other, we misread this situation. And we said for 1400 years that it is only for those who are unmarried that the law is now mansukh. But for those who are married, that law is still operational. The law of the Torah is still operational. Because the Prophet Muhammad did not enact this law. He did not bring this law into the world. He simply enforced the law of the Torah, which the Jews themselves were not enforcing. Is there anything from the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, anything at all, which says that the new law is applicable only to those who are unmarried? Did he say so? He did not. He did not. At the end of this period of revelation, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down revelation. And listen to what he says. Since the door to mercy is now closed, he says in Surah Al-A'raf, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوَ الْعَذَابِ Your Lord has now announced that he is now going to raise against them those who will inflict upon them until the last day the worst possible punishment. The worst possible punishment. Who are they who are now raised against Banu Israel? The first, the Prophet is asleep at the home of his wife Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha and he sees something in his sleep. This hadith 
is in Sahih Bukhari. Do you know how many times? Eight times. Eight times. From four different companions of the Prophet. Alayhi salatu wasalam. What does he say? He woke up from his sleep. He has seen something in his sleep. It is terrible. And he wakes up and his face is all flushed red. And he says, Wailul lil Arab, min sharrin qadik taraba. Woe unto the Arabs. Because they are the ones who are going to be targeted most of all. And I tell you, if you are an Arab today, you know what is fire. I can travel the world and preach and I usually get visas. One of the reasons for it is because I am not Arab. If I had been Arab, it would have been a different kettle of fish altogether. Woe unto the Arabs, he said, because of a great evil which will now come upon them, which is close by. And then he put his fingers like this and he said, Today, mark the words, today, a hole has been made in the barrier built by Zulkarnain. And so Gog and Magog are now going to be released. The release of Gog and Magog commenced in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Who else is going to be raised against Banu Israel? Who will now inflict upon them until the last day the worst possible punishment? The Prophet said, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a person, not a system, no, 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 a person, and endowed that person with awesome power and awesome versatility and a PhD in deception. Who is it? Dajjal. He's known as Al Masih al Dajjal. Why? Because when he's released into the world, his mission is to impersonate the Messiah. Since the mission of the Messiah is to rule the world from Jerusalem, Dajjal, in order to successfully fulfill that mission of impersonating the Messiah, will also have to rule the world from Jerusalem. In order for him to do that, there is an elementary logical deduction for him to convince the Jews that this is the real thing, that this is indeed the return of the golden age. The Jal will, number one, have to liberate the Holy Land of non-Jewish rule. He did that already in 1919 while we were either sleeping or eating halwa. <laughs> Number two, Dajjal will have to bring Banu Israel back to the Holy Land, not as tourists, but to reclaim the land as theirs. He did that already. Between 1919 and 1948, Banu Israel were allowed to return to the Holy Land. Prior to 1919, the Ottoman Islamic Empire prohibited the return of the Jews to the Holy Land in any capacity other than that as tourists. Number three, the Jal will have to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land and convince Banu Israel that this is the real thing. Of course, it won't. It'll be an imposter. He's done that already. In 1948, that state of Israel was born while we were either sleeping or eating halwa. <laughs> Number four, Dajjal will have to cause that state of Israel to become the ruling state in all. And that is why George Bush has to attack Iraq. I'm not going to tell you anymore. You unravel that one. Let me see your intuitive intellect at work. What is the connection between an American attack on Iraq and Israel becoming the ruling state in the world? You do your homework now. 
when Israel becomes the ruling state in the world. And if you have doubts as to whether I'm saying it's true or not, you just wait. No? Just wait until Israel becomes the ruling state in the world. Just wait. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, then the Jews will be absolutely convinced that the golden age has come back. And we're now ruling the world once again. But that would be a one-eyed people. You and I, you and I would know that that is the most wondrous deception the most magnificent deception that the world has ever witnessed in its entire history. When Banu Israel are absolutely convinced that the golden age has come again, that Judaism's claim to truth is now validated, and so Islam is false, and Christianity is false, and Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam and Nabi Isa alayhi salam, they are false. After Israel has ruled the world for a certain period of time, then Al-Masih al-Dajjal will now appear in person. And he would rule the world from Jerusalem with what would appear to be the end of history, eternal rule. Mm -hmm. The hadith pertaining to this is located in Sahih Muslim. It says that when Dajjal is released, he will live on earth for 40 days. One day like a year, one day like a month, one day like a week, and the rest of his days like your days. In fact, I consider this hadith to be so important that I took, I got my graphic artist in Kuala Lumpur to design the cover of the book Jerusalem in the Quran using this hadith. One day like a year, and you'd see a circle, and in that circle you'd see the island of Britain. One day like a month, and you see in that circle the United States of America. And then one day like a week, and you'd see in that circle the state of Israel. And so, وَإِسْتَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوَ الْعَذَابِ And your Lord has announced that he will now raise against Banu Israel those who will inflict upon Banu Israel until the last day the worst possible punishment. It's not only Gog and Magog, it is also Dajjal. And it is also Dabatul Ard. That beast that Arian Sharon is now riding. A very interesting event now takes place in Medina either shortly before or shortly after the incident of the dream. And Wailul lil Arab, eh? indicating that Gog and Magog are now released. What is it? The Prophet والسلام, is now speaking a lot about Dajjal. He never spoke on this subject in Mecca. He never spoke on this subject for 17 months in Medina. But now, after the change in Qibla, for the first time, he's talking about the subject of Dajjal. All the ahadith on Dajjal are all from Medina. Post change of Qibla. Having spoken a lot about Dajjal, explaining to us a lot of things about Dajjal, he now says that he suspects a Jewish boy to be Dajjal, Ibn Sayyad. So he takes Omar radiallahu ta'ala anhu with him. And he goes to question the boy. But Ibn Sayyad is rather impertinent in his replies. And Omar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is furious. He says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, give me permission, I cut off his head. <laughs> the Prophet said, No, Omar. 
If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him. And if he is not Dajjal, it will be sinful to kill him. Go search the hadith, you'll find it in my book downstairs. If he is Dajjal, you cannot kill him, indicates the possibility exists that he can be Dajjal. Are you with me? Don't go away, eh? If the possibility exists that he can be Dajjal, then that is only possible if Dajjal has been released. And so the release of Dajjal also takes place in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Because Dajjal is released, and Gog and Magog are released, Qiyamah has now started in the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad And this is why he said, Ana wal Qiyama kahatain. I and Qiyama are like these two fingers. Now you understand the hadith. Hmm? When was the body of Fir'aun discovered? At the end of the 19th century. When was the Zionist movement created? At the end of the 19th century. It is the Zionist movement which pioneers the return of the Jews to the Holy Land and the restoration of his state of Israel. But the Prophet spoke about ten signs of the last day. They are Dajjal, number two, Gog and Magog, number three, the son, the return of, the son of Mary. Which, which Jesus coming back? The son of Mary. You sure? The son of Maryam, eh? Well then how could that fellow in Kadian say what he said? Have you no sense in your head? Is it only peanuts up there? And you're still defending him? And you're still defending the Ahmadis as good people? Do you have peanuts up there? Instead of brains? Will you not wake up? He said, it is the son of Mary who will come back. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad declared that the prophecy is fulfilled in him. But the son of Mary is coming back and he is the son of a Punjabi woman. <laughs> Have you got peanuts up there? We pray that Allah may guide them out of their misguidance. We pray that Allah may guide them out of their misguidance. And we offer them our book, Jerusalem in the Quran, as a guide that will help them out of their misguidance. The followers of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and those who refuse to declare he was a kafir. Number four. Because of number four, you had that conference in Johannesburg. Hmm? Number four is Dukhan, smoke. Number five, Dabbatul Ard. Allah is speaking about Ard here. The Prophet والسلام, is speaking about Ard in the context of the last age, the signs of Qiyamah. And nine times out of ten, when the word Ard is used in connection with the last age, it refers to Al Ardul Muqaddasa. And so Dabbatul Ard is Dabbatul Ardul Muqaddasa. Hmm? Dabbatul Ardul Muqaddasa. A beast will emerge out of the Holy Land. It is plain for everybody to see except George Bush. Where, who is that beast which has emerged out of the Holy Land and is behaving like a wild beast to such an extent that even Jewish intellectuals now, 
Even Jewish intellectuals in Israel are now denouncing it. And are warning the world of a tremendous catastrophe which is about to occur. I'm not the only one talking about it. Jewish intellectuals in the state of Israel are denouncing this beast. The state of Israel in the hands of those who now want it to become the ruling state in the world. As soon as the body of Iran was discovered, the countdown has begun. When I was here last December, I said that September the 11th represents the opening rounds of what will eventually result in the state of Israel replacing the United States of America as the ruling state in the world. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, it is then that oppression will truly begin. Particularly if you're an Arab. Particularly if you're an Arab. Yes. It is then that oppression will really begin. To use an African-American expression, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. If there are those who are coming to you and saying to you that the sunshine is about to come, the dark night is about to end, and Islam is going to become triumphant in the world tomorrow, they're misguiding you. No. The darkest part of the night still lies ahead. And I have come to give this message to you. How do you survive this darkest night which is still ahead of us? And how do you continue to participate in the jihad for the liberation of the Holy Land because that jihad has already started? We don't need any fatwa. Oh no. And no one can stop that jihad. No one can stop that jihad. That jihad is not going to end in any peace treaty in Oslo or in Madrid or in downtown Washington. No, no, no. That jihad will culminate when Dajjal is killed by the true Messiah, when Gog and Magog are killed, destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then said the Prophet to Islam, when you see the black flags coming from the direction of Khorasan, and Afghanistan is a part of Khorasan, go and join our army, because no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. And so, the British tried to colonize Afghanistan, and the British failed. And then the Russians tried, and the Russians failed. And guess who is trying now? <laughs> we honor and we respect Mullah Umar. We honor him and we respect him. Because all those other excellencies, rulers in the Muslim world, if they had been ordered by Uncle Sam to hand over Osama bin Laden, they would have handed him faster than Federal Express. <laughs> but Mullah Umar said no. And may Allah bless him. Mullah Umar said no. If he has committed this crime, give us the evidence. That was a very reasonable request. But Uncle Sam replied and said, no, we are not accustomed to this kind of response. We, Uncle Sam, when we say stand up, you stand up. When we say sit down, you sit down. So Mullah Omar replied and said, we are Muslims and we don't treat our guests like that. So we honor him and we respect him for the integrity of his heart and for his matchless courage. He knew what his people were going to face. He said, when the Soviet Union attacked us, they took our cities and they took our airports. But they couldn't take the countryside. And we fought them from the mountains. And we fought them from the countryside. And it took us 12 years to throw the Soviet Union out. And so, Uncle Sam, the battle has just started in Afghanistan. It has just started. The day will come when Islam will throw the, Soviet, throw the United States out of Afghanistan. 
Yes. When that Muslim army defeats the United States in Afghanistan, even if it takes 25, 30, 40 years, it is that army which will be unstoppable. Unstoppable. When our army reaches the Holy Land, the Prophet spoke. This is the hadith they don't want me to quote in Singapore. Which is why the authorities in Singapore have now denied me permission to deliver public lectures in Singapore for the first time in 14 years. Listen to the hadith. They say it, it creates problems for their interfaith relations. The Prophet said, it is Sahih Bukhari, it is Sahih Muslim, it is Muttafaqun Ali. This is why I quote this hadith. There's another hadith in Sahih Muslim which is longer. But it is not Muttafaqun Ali, so I choose this one. He said, لَتُقَاتِلُنَّ الْيَهُودِ You will most certainly fight the Jews. وَلَتَقْتُلُنَّهُمْ And you will most certainly kill them, so you will be victorious. حَتَّى يَقُولُ الْحَجَرَ At that time the stones will speak. Ya Muslim! هَذَا يَهُودِيٌ وَرَأِي There's a Jew hiding behind me. فَتَعَالَ فَقْتُلْ So come, come, come and kill him. These are the words of Prophet Muhammad صلى الله تعالى عليه وسلم. You can tell who are those who are faithful to him because they will have no fear to quote this hadith. You can tell who are those who are betraying the Messenger of Allah because you'll never hear them quoting this hadith. This is a litmus test. A Muslim army now liberates the Holy Land. The state of Israel is destroyed because Allah said, in Uttum. Udna. And so the warning of Allah has come to pass. And the Islamic State now replaces that imposter Israel. And that Islamic State will now become the ruling state in the world. The definition of a ruling state being a state which can impose its will on any rival. And Islam will rule the world from Jerusalem. The Messiah will rule the world from Jerusalem. And the promise communicated with Isaiah is now fulfilled. Imam al-Mahdi will live for seven years and then die. And this is my topic for a few days from now. Imam al-Mahdi and the return of the Khilafah. But Isa al-Islam will, will, will live for 40 years and then die. This is his mouth, Qabla Mauti. He will get married, and as I told you, I hope it will be a Palestinian Muslim girl, inshallah. And he will have children. I told you the Pope doesn't know about that. And then he will die. And the Prophet said, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, that you will perform Salatul Janazah over his body. And he said that he'd be buried next to me in Medina. This has been Jerusalem in the Quran. You have more information in the Quran and in the Hadith than you need. An abundance of information in the Quran and the Hadith. Explaining to you today, so plainly and clearly, the world in which you live today. How do you respond? to the awesome predicament of this moment. How do you respond to the challenges of the world in which we live today? This is my topic entitled The Muslim Village on which I spoke at Salatul Jum'ah. I don't have the time of course tonight so that from that Muslim village will emerge the lions who will go and liberate the Holy Land. Who is the Mahdi? The Mahdi is a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad The Prophet said that his name will be my name and his father's name will be my father's name. 
and he'll have a broad forehead and a large nose. But uh, the Imam al-Mahdi, with whom the Khilafah will be restored, listen carefully, the Imam al-Mahdi cannot emerge, cannot arise, until Dajjal has completed his mission. And therefore, until Israel has become the ruling state in the world, and that has not as yet happened, and until Israel has ruled the world for a day, which is like a week, and that has not yet happened, and until the water in the Sea of Galilee has run dry, and that has not as yet happened. And so it is not very sensible, and this is polite language, it is not very sensible to be speculating whether Imam al-Mahdi has already been born, and whether he's in Damascus, or whether he's in Yemen and so on, that's not very sensible. Please stop doing that. What is the specific advice that the Prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam gave to us for protection from Dajjal. He said, recite Surah al kaf every Friday. Every Friday. And it'll, it'll give you protection until the next Friday. How? How will it give you protection? Noor will come down upon you from the heavens to the earth. And that Noor will remain with you until the next Friday. What is that? What is the connection with that Noor and Dajjal? The answer is, it is with that Noor that you'll be able to see with two eyes, while Dajjal sees with one eye. So you'll be able to understand his strategy, his deception. Next question, how did you come to the conclusion that the end, end is E-N-D, isn't it? How did you come to the conclusion that the end will be in approximately 50 years? I never came to that conclusion. Only Allah knows when the end will be. Nobody knows, not even the Imam knows. Only Allah knows when the end will come. I never said that the end is going to come in 50 years. You are saying that, not me. I said that the return of the son of Mary, that I expect in about 50 years time. Not the end. That's a two different thing. Nobody knows when the end will come, the end of the world. How did I come to that conclusion? I used two methods. If you read my book, you will see the arguments. The one, method number one, the water level in the Sea of Galilee. And method number two, a day like a year, a day like a month, a day like a week. Who are Gog and Magog? Are they funny looking people or are they normal human beings? Huh? To answer that question, we have to locate a people who prior to Wailul al Arab, prior to the time of the Prophet Muhammad had no special links with the Holy Land. But after the Prophet Muhammad are now obsessed with liberating the Holy Land. Only one people qualify. It's Europe. Europe after the Prophet Muhammad embarks upon the Crusades. It's the white people doing it, the European. It's not an essentially Christian phenomenon. Why? Because no other Christians are involved in the Crusades, only Europe. So the Crusades are an essentially European phenomenon masquerading as Christianity. Secondly, the obsession with the Holy Land continues with the Zionist movement. But the Zionist movement is European. But it is masquerading as Jewish. How do we know that? No other Jews are involved in the effort to liberate the Holy Land, only the European. Hmm? And then finally we have the island of Britain, which is now secular and godless. But this Britain now issues the famous Balfour Declaration in 1917 that it is the intention of the British government 
to work for the establishment of a Jewish national home in the Holy Land? This is strange. I think I told you the only thing stranger than this ever happened in history was when the cow jumped over the moon. Huh? This strange obsession on the part of Europe for liberating the Holy Land, which they eventually did in 1919, indicates that Gog and Magog are located in European civilization. We can refine it even more than that. We can be specific within European civilization. Because the Hadith is that when Gog and Magog are released, the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee and start to drink the water. And by the time the last of them pass, they'll say, there used to be water here. Who are they who are drinking the water from the Sea of Galilee? Not the Egyptians, not the Jordanians, not the Syrians. Who? Israel. <coughs> who in Israel? Not Banu Israel, the European. It is the European Jew who controls the state of Israel. And it is he who has established the modern economy, which is drinking the water, the industrial economy. That's where the water is going. And it is he as the government of Israel who has established the policy of making the deserts green. You need a lot of water to do that. So we can identify Gog and Magog not only in Europe, but also in that part of Europe which is Jewish. Hmm? What analogy, analogy can we draw between the Freemasons and al Masihud Dajjal? The Freemasonry movement has its origins and its roots in ancient Israel and in the Old Testament. Hmm? <coughs> a lot of the symbols which are used by the Freemasonry and a lot of the beliefs in the Freemasonry system comes out of the ancient scriptures, ancient Jewish scriptures. But the Jews have transformed the Freemasonry movement to be an international movement, not an exclusively Jewish movement. So that the link between Freemasonry and Judaism no longer exists today in the popular consciousness. So a Prime Minister of Australia can be a Freemason, yeah? And a Prime Minister of Britain who is not a Jew can be a Freemason. The reason why they have done that is so that they could use this movement, the Freemasonry movement, as a front through which they could pursue their objectives without allowing themselves to be identified as the actor. So they can remain as the hidden actor behind the Freemasonry and the Illuminati. <coughs> 